source of most of Mexico's violence is the drugs trade. Most of the cocaine is actually bound for the U.S., where it costs around $585 per kilo. Now, by the time it's passed through Mexico and reached America, it actually is worth about $24,000. Let's look at all of this in more detail. I'm joined now by Dr. Thomas Rath. He's a lecturer in Latin American history. It's great to have you with us. So let's just go through exactly what's been going on in Mexico, because this is really quite a story, isn't it? It's uh, a number of cartels, isn't it, which mm -hmm. uh, seem to control the trade we can see there. But two main ones we're looking at here, the Sinaloa Federation, which is the one in red in the west, and also Los Itas in the green. And I'm going to ask you to tell us a bit more about their leaders, because between them both, they seem to have a sort of an uneasy alliance that controls most of the country. Let's start with Sinaloa here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a very uneasy alliance, relatively recent. Um, but uh, I guess one of the really interesting things about them is that the, the two leaders, El Chapo Guzman and Zeta 42, mm -hmm. they have quite different reputations. El Chapo is, some, for many Mexicans, is something of a folk hero, particularly in his home state of Sinaloa. People sing songs about him. He has this sort of colorful life of uh, he escaped from jail in a laundry basket when he was on the lam. And he, he was actually controlling the business from jail oh, as well. Oh, absolutely. And he was, when he was on the lam, he threw legendary sort of parties. Uh, which sort of happened and then before the police could get there they were all sort of and they, they went they made off so he's got that sort of mm. folk hero image the Zetas are very different they have the reputation really of being terrifying that's how they do things um, their origins are significant here they their origins really are from a, a group of military deserters uh, and so they they keep that sort of military style and how they do things and um, it's not just a reputation I mean some of the worst atrocities that we've seen in Mexico, several hundred people killed at a time, are up in the sort of Zeta homeland in the northeast yeah. of the country. Let's look at that in more detail because as you say, there's pockets, isn't there, of violence. Mm. And you can see the darker colours here, uh, the darker the colour basically, the greater the incidence of um, drug-related homicides yeah. up near the border, particularly Absolutely. dangerous area. And, and you know, this is very, very important to break this down regionally. I'm very glad you're doing this because, you know, it's very hard to kind of get a grip on. Mexico's a big, complicated place, mm -hmm. um, very regionalised. And it is very, in specific places, there's appalling violence, but then there's other places you can be living there. Somewhere like Mexico City has been really insulated from a lot of this. So it, it gives the whole thing a, a bit of an un, sort of unreal feel. You can be somewhere and then read about appalling things in the press, sure. but not necessarily being experienced. Feel it, feel it feeling it, it yeah. I mean, yeah. it's interesting, though. This, is, this pattern, actually, if we look at the routes taken to smuggle the drugs through the country, you can see the correlation there Absolutely. as well, can't you? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, that's where most of these cartels get their money from, the drug trade, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Mm -hmm. And so there is a correlation with the, the highest level of drug-related homicides. Um, yeah, and let's have a look at those numbers then, because as you say, sure, the sure. drug trade itself, it's quite extraordinary when you actually look at the numbers here, because it's massive, isn't it? $30 billion, 4% of GDP, mm. half a million people. That's quite an industry. It's, it's an, I mean, that's the root of it. There's yeah. an awful a lot of money to be made. The converse of that is that there's many, many people in Mexico. I mean, the richest man in the world is Mexican. But of course. Generally, there's a lot of people who are very, very poor mm -hmm. and have fewer other economic opportunities. So that's part of this sort of pattern, why, why this, I mean, there's money to be made and there's few other routes for people. Yeah. I should also say that, I mean, drugs are very important. These kind of figures show you that. I mean, it's difficult to know, isn't it, how much they produce, but this is the amount seized, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it gives you some indication, at least, of the sort of proportions of what's being trafficked. Um, some of the organizations have diversified. They're canny businessmen. They also do kidnapping, extortion, mm -hmm. people trafficking, particularly the Zetas, I think. Um, so I mean, you can see exactly how mm. this happens because it all comes along these routes here, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, and, and migration Central. from Central America also follows the same routes as drugs. And um, we can see, well, when you look at the, the actual figures of where the drugs end up, this is cocaine, 90% mm. of it going to the US. Yeah, it's, um, well, 90% of cocaine in the US comes from Mexico. It's interesting, I mean, a bit of historical perspective is, is interesting here. Mm. Mexico in the 1990s, when I became interested in mm -hmm. it, uh, was quite a stable place. It wasn't very democratic, yeah. it was quite stable. Uh, and that had to do with, when well, there were drugs going through Mexico, but there were other routes through the Caribbean. Those got closed off, and more and more of it became channeled through Mexico through wow. the 80s and 90s. And I think that has helped one of the reasons why um, um, the cartels have become more powerful and wealthier. And yet only 2% of it is actually seized. Dr. Rath, mm. thank you.